um, hi, welcome everyone to Meet the Publishers, Meet the Publisher, um, Portrait of an Independent Press. Uh, this event was produced in partnership with the San Francisco Writers Conference. Uh, my name is Taryn Edwards and I am one of the librarians here at the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco. Uh, coming to you from my driveway in San Leandro, California, across the bay. Just over here. Um, so, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Mechanics Institute, we are a uh, independent membership organization uh, that houses a wonderful library, which is the oldest, in fact, designed to serve the public in California, not just mechanics. Um, we're also a cultural event center and the uh, nation's oldest chess club. Um, right now, due to the shelter in place, all of our events are virtual, but I encourage you to consider becoming a member with us. It's only $120 a year, and that helps, uh, your support helps us uh, with our cultural activities and um, our library and all the other fun things that we do uh, that benefits the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. Um, our speakers today include Sirong Kerr, who is the founder of Tailwinds Press, which is an independent press based in the New York area. We also have Shane Race Legland, who is a member of the Mechanics Institute's writing community. Uh, he was born in Western Montana and attended the university there. And he is the author of May We One Day Pick All the Shrapnel from Our Hearts. And so he'll talk about that um, this afternoon. We also have Maria Espinosa, who is the author of five novels, including the one she'll be talking about today called Suburban Souls. And um, she has taught creative writing and contemporary literature at New College of California and English as a second language for City College of San Francisco. Uh, but right now she lives in Albuquerque. So the way it'll work today is all three speakers will share their knowledge and discuss their recent projects and then we'll open things up for discussion. Um, we're kind of a larger group than I expected today, which is yay. Um, and so why don't you post the questions that you have um, in the chat space and we'll fold those into the conversation. And then later we'll open things up so we can all chat together uh, with your microphones off. I mean, on. Um, all right, uh, take it away, Sharon. <laughs> Thanks. And first of all, I do want to thank Taryn, our host, and the Mechanics Institute. This looks like an amazing institution. I'm very jealous it doesn't exist in sunny Connecticut. I'm being sarcastic. It's not sunny. In, in where, where I am right now, um, it, it looks like an incredibly rich and vibrant community, and I'm looking forward to learning more about it. So I'm Shirong. I'm the publisher. Um, I nominally run the show around here. Tailwinds is an independent press, and we've been around since 2014. We focus primarily on manuscript length literary fiction. So the model of the press is pretty simple. People send me manuscripts, and I choose the most beautiful and brilliant ones that I like the most, and I publish five or six of them in partnership with the authors. So, so before, so the stars of the show here are really Shane Race and Maria. Um, but I just wanted to sort of say a few words about sort of why the press exists and sort of what it's about. So the creation myth um, that I always tell is that in 2012, I was I, I was reading the 600-page tome of poems by Anne Sexton, and as you know, she has her own creation myth. Where one aspect of the myth is that she's she she goes through a lot of difficulties in her life, and and a religious authority, in this case a priest, told her um, during one of these phases, "God is in your typewriter," and. Her poems are awesome. I love Anne Sexton, and that's a great thing to be told. Um, but when I read this the first time, I felt profound discomfort that over the years turned into resentment. I gradually came to believe, and I think the turning point was around 2012, that the authority to see deep value in art has to consist of a process of self-initiation by readers. Reading is not a passive activity. To say that reading is a passive activity is like saying that skiing is a passive activity, like, like you're just rolling down the hill. Reading is an active partnership in a joint creative endeavor that's intensely personal, sacred, and extremely powerful. And as long as we wait 
for someone else to tell us whose typewriter the divine is living in. Literature will be detached from the people who connect to it most deeply. So that's the first aspect of the creation myth. There's a second aspect of the press that I want to emphasize. So this is not on the face of it an Asian American press. I haven't published any novels with Asian American themes. I don't seek them out. I think once I unintentionally published an author who might have been half Asian when I looked at his press photo, but in, this is not like an overtly Asian press. But I am Asian American and I grew up with a background assumption um, with, of a certain set of proto-Confucian values. And one of them is best expressed as this. In text, everyone is equal. I don't research people before I publish them. I try not to think about the author's identity at all when I look at the manuscripts. Occasionally, I accept a book and we, like the authors and I talk and, and people ask me, like, do you want to know more about what I do? And I'm like, no, 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 that, that would just confuse me. It should be about the books. It shouldn't be about who you are, what your scene is, like whether you have friends or critics, whether you have friends who are well-known, whether you have friends like at all. Um, it should be about what you write. And, and this is the myth of what I was taught was the Chinese imperial civil service that I grew up on with, with these like six week long exams and like that determines your whole life and people spend their entire life studying for this like ultra, ultra SAT. And if the press is any strong ideology, it would be that ideal of everyone being equal before what is written down. So every book here represents and you know, it's not just Shane, Race, and Maria. We, we publish, I publish several a year and sort of there are all, all these other authors of which Shane, Race, and Maria are sort of a, a representative sample. But the books on my website represent not just this absolutely brilliant book on its own, which it is, but it's also what's fundamentally a political statement. I can't think of anything more radical than to allow your own vision and your own aesthetics to be seen and heard and to help create things that you believe to be beautiful and good. It's very much an honor to publish Shane Race and to publish Maria and the rest of the authors. And if I'm hoping that you come away with any other message other than that like these books are great and you should order them on Amazon or Barnes and Noble and um, probably Powell's. It, it, the other point is to, is, is to urge people to ask the same questions that I ask. Where are you unprivileged in your life? Where are you invisible and unheard? And what do we create with that knowledge? So that's enough for me. I think, I think we should do sort of what we did on our initial launch. Um, I think the writers, uh, Shane Brayson and Maria are going to introduce themselves and their books. And then I'm going to ask some questions and we can do a little Q and A. So Shane Race, why don't you kick it off this time? <laughs> Uh, my name is uh, Shane Reese uh, Ligrand. Um, that is a pseudonym, but you know it's my real, you know, middle name. My parents, uh, uh, my parents were weird. Um, so Shane, uh, my name is Shane Reese. I grew up in uh, uh, Montana, um, and you know, after you know, after high school, went to University of Montana. Uh, after I left University of Montana, about two thousand seven. I, uh, you know, came down to the Bay Area just, you know, for work. Um, but, you know, just the amount of work that I was getting, the, the, the also, you know, people that I knew back in Montana who did not, you know, leave, I really kind of started this story of just kind of, you know, underemployment and just lack of, um, I don't want to say lack of hope, but, you know, people not viewing themselves in the, in, in the proper light. So uh, may we one day pick all our shrapnel from our hearts uh, right here. It's, it's about that kind of, um, you know, bad cycle that you people get into um, of uh, just self uh, uh, of loathing of not, you know, making, you know, it out, making it in life as they wanted to. Uh, it takes uh, place in uh, over a short period of time in uh, Missoula, Montana. And, um, you know, the main character is a man who uh, believes his wife is way too good for him. Um, and he believes that he, you know, in order for her to have a good life, she has to leave him. And so he goes, um, goes through a plan to get his wife to leave him. Um, 
and um, you know, over the course of the novel, he begins to learn to you know care for himself, but also more more importantly, learn to accept love from others. That's great, um, Maria. Oops. <laughs> Maria, you're up. Are you on mute? No, she's on mute. You're on mute. We can't hear you. Taryn, can you unmute Maria? Okay. Oh, uh, perfect. Yeah, here. I wanted to show the cover first. And it's about a really anguished woman and an anguished family. And yet, the whole book is not anguish. It's very much about life in the 70s in the Bay Area, which I understand is now almost a historical period. And it's about the effect that people who suffered trauma as in the whole escaping the Holocaust, specifically a family of German Jews, uh, cast pass this on through their children and how it affects their children. And I think I, all I can say is read the book. <laughs> it's so hard to talk about something I've just written. I find myself really blocked about it. As my own life, I grew up in Long Island, despite my Hispanic name. I married a Chilean writer. And since I never felt okay with my given name, I began calling myself Maria. Now I also call myself Paula Maria, which given name, given name. And I lived in the Bay Area for a long time from the 60s until quite recently. So I've seen the changes that happen and I've just seen how particularly one disturbed member in a family, particularly the mother especially, can affect everyone around her. And more especially in the book, I talk about the lack, I describe how the lack of communication between people creates so much suffering, how people really can go somewhat crazy by not feeling seen or heard, or as Jiarong says, feeling invisible, feeling that they're, what they think is not heard falls on deaf ears, what they perceive is just not seen by the rest of the world kind of isolation this creates. And in the book, the young, the daughter, one of the daughters tries to overcome this by moving to a commune in the Santa Cruz mountains. Again, a very 70s kind of feel. All I can say is read the book, buy it. <laughs> I'll get I'll, I'll get back to you. There, there's, there's much more to say about the book, and you know, and and I think you know dur during this, sorry, during this um sort of segment, I I'll, I'll be sort of making observations about the book, but you know, I I I personally am very bad at like listening to things. Like as as a kid, I could never sit still when the teachers read to us. I was one of the, these kids who were just like reading under the table, and the teacher was like reading at us. And, like I was just always pissed off all the time. So so at these readings, I've been trying to get people to like not read, and I just like surprise them with questions. So and these are like kind of unrehearsed questions when I ask the authors. So so it's sort of an uncontrolled situation, which I thought maybe the audience might appreciate. So, but but like apologies in advance to, to Shane Rice and Maria, but but that's just I, I I try to think about what would keep me interested if I were if I were in one of these. So so that's that's just an explanation of the format. So so let's come back to Shane Rice. Um, so and this is the second time we've sort of done the launch. We had a group launch a few weeks back. So some of these conversations are conversations that are continuing from things we talked about a little bit. Um, the first time. So one of the things that come to mind when I think about this book, um, it's actually not fiction. It's sort of philosophers who focus on the control of the self. So when I reach back in my mind and ask myself, like, what does this remind me of? There's this aspect of classical stoicism, you know, Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus, and also existentialism, you know, like Camus, The Stranger. So one aspect of 
these different approaches to living is the idea of self-mastery regardless of what crap is happening on the outside. So for the existentialists in their language, it's expressed as freedom. Uh, for the Stoics, it's expressed as like a disciplined manner of life. And I always say that when you read Epictetus, it makes you want to clean the house. Like it, it actually makes you want to like reorganize all of the shelves and all the crap in your kitchen. So, but they result in a very similar demeanor being presented to the external world, which is that of extreme self-sufficiency. Um, and this goes along with my sense that there's a very strong tradition in literature of men who don't talk much. And, and I think that's inextricably tied to both the existentialists and to stoicism. Like you see that in The Stranger, but you also see that in things that, you know, are sort of, you see that in like Last of the Mohicans or Steinbeck and like, like probably the king of that is like Hemingway, you know, there's, to be this is important because silence in sort of Western society is seen as both a sword and a shield. Silence helps you preserve the core of your, of your inner self. It, it keeps you in, in some sense pure and authentic, but it's also used to withhold resources. And in that case, it's a sword and, and then you become like the, the passive aggressive cliche. So I guess my question for Shane Race with that preamble is, you know, what, what would you take to be the role of silence in this novel? Because the silent, one of the things I love about the book is that silence is everywhere. It's like the book is like words and it's like a conventional narrative, but you can feel the silence kind of seeping into your bones as you're reading the text. Even when people are, are saying things, you can feel that sense of peace and silence. Um, so I just want to sort of hear your views on that. Um, you know, one portion of the book, I talk about, um, you know, football and how um, the main character doesn't really care about football, but he knows he has to, to talk about it. He has to know about it so he can relate to other men. And, you know, he, he kind of comes to this realization that, you know, I mean, a lot of these sports are there just so men have a reason to talk to one another, you know, and can actually begin to make that conversation with people. Um, you know, I, I, the human you know, person needs a lot of um, interaction. You know, you know, we are, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> you know, you know, we are a social group, but there's so much of this uh, intention of uh, uh, of just you know suppressing your, you know you know these things down because you know uh, if you know you uh, appear too you know interested in another person that's going to you know you know be suspect. Um, uh, I I feel that you know people have a real need to say really what's in their mind, but they cannot. Uh, because they they feel that what's going to be coming out of their mouths will be you know chaotic and you know ultimately you know ruins them to them. Um, uh, and then this you know leads down to you know a, you know a breakdown of communication. One of the you know big themes of this book is the lack of communication. You know the the main character doesn't know what to say to his wife. Um, his daughter is uh, disabled, who's, who's, uh, who's deaf, and um, they do communicate, but only through sign language. Uh, she knows how to speak, um, but has, you know, recently, you know, stopped speaking, um, and he has no idea how to get her to stop, you know, start speaking again. So the idea of, of silence is, um, you know, people are, are just, you know, getting more and more just isolated and, you know, you know, push back because they're, they're too afraid of, um, you know, all the emotions that they have just spilling out all at once, if that's possible. Um, yeah, I, I would say uh, just in response to the, you know, uh, uh, sorry, Epictetus uh, and, you know, the classic stoicism is, I mean, you know, especially on a, like a, a manly kind of uh, view of the world uh, of it's really easy to write something down in a book 
and say, these are the laws that you should follow. Um, it, you know, it's really easy to write, you know, as existentialists, you know, for existentialists talking about freedom and about, um, uh, um, you know, how is a man to work in, the, you know, uh, man or woman to work in the world. Um, but that's not, you know, living, you know, people feel this, you know, urge to, to speak and, you know, they can't, they're, they're too afraid to, um, you know, just lose everything by just saying everything they, they want. That's okay. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. That's great. Um, this is, so, so this is sort of, no, and I, I agree with this. Um, one of the things that I really enjoy about the book and this, go, go, in some sense, it's, it makes me think of Marcus Aurelius in the sense that they're living according to these, there's a background assumption of, of a stoic principle, I think in your book and also in Marcus Aurelius. But when you, and, and, and that's, that's seen in you know, the, way your, the way your protagonist acts and the way he thinks about things, I think there is this kind of surrender and resignation and also strength in the character that's really, really important to, to the book. But I think that, um, I, I think it also conveys how, the, how difficult the Stoic philosophy is and sort of what, what the costs of it might be. And, and I think this sort of segues into my second question, which is his silence is an output issue. Um, just like his daughter's deafness is like an output issue. What about the, the input? Um, you know, how does, how, how does his lack of visibility to people like his wife or, you know, his kid's teacher doesn't listen to him, you know, or his employer, how does that sort of, you know, fading in and out of other people's lives interact with silence, do you think? Uh -huh. I think it, you know, reinforces the role he's supposed to play um, in the sense uh, he's not, uh, the, amount, uh, the amount of silence that he's, you know, giving, right, you know, you know, he obviously wants to talk more, he obviously wants to speak more, but, um, you know, it just reinforced that he's not getting that, you know, that input and that this is, you know, just normally what he's, you know, to expect from people. You know, and he's living his life how he's, he's supposed to. You know, he's raising his, his, his daughter. He's, you know, um, you know, you know, he's going to his wife's events, um, supporting his wife, you know, when he can. But, um, you know, he, this is what, he, you know, he's supposed to be, but this is what he cannot really, you know, be. If that makes any sense. You no, know, it makes total sense, and it, it makes sense in the best possible way, which is like you, when you when you read it, it's um, you you feel the truth of that more than like when you articulate it, which shows that it's necessary. If it were articulable, I guess it wouldn't be the the, the book would be redundant. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, it's it's a very enigmatic, very short novel. It's easy to explain the plot. It's easy to write off Bridger as being someone who's derailed by circumstance. I mean, his life kind of sucks, so there's that aspect of it. But I think there's also this like atmospheric sadness to the book that goes that goes beyond that um, and his self sufficiency and he's there's something so mysterious and very compelling about the writing. So, with most authors, I can kind of sort of I can tell what the literary influences are, um, and with this book, it's it's hard for me to see an obvious lineage. And, you know, and there's a little bit of Virginia Woolf, a little bit of To the Lighthouse, which is like a different book, but it, it, it's important in that To the Lighthouse also acknowledges human suffering in a way that's a little, a little remote and it helps you make peace with that suffering in a very like graceful, calm way. I mean, I think people forget that like really terrible things happen in To the Lighthouse, right? Like there's a chap, there's like a section this big where like six people die and it's kind of like no but you know people kind of move on and the book goes on and like people you know still like do their thing um even though it's been traumatic and so so who do you consider to be your influences in as a as a literary writer 
Um, you know, it, it, it's strange because I, uh, for what I, you know, read a lot of, um, this actually uh, was a break from, you know, most of my, my big influences. Um, I really you know, enjoyed a lot of the South American uh, writers, a lot of the fabulous, a lot of the, um, um, what's it called? You, you know, um, names are hard. <laughs> you know, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, um, Carlos Fuentes. Um, and actually the very first uh, uh, version of, uh, sorry, the very first um, version of this book started out as a short story and it was a magic realist. And um, I really just had a huge disillusionment with magic realism. Not that I don't like the, the old writers. I just didn't realize, I just realized that this is not what I, you know, I wanted to write. Um, I would say if any of the magic realists probably you know, are closest, I'd probably put Filiberto uh, Be uh, Hernandez, um, who was a, you know, considered the founder of the magic realism. He was a Uruguayan uh, um, writer, um, not successful in his life at all. Um, and he started kind of, you know, adding some things in, but, you know, a lot of his works were about, you know, kind of, um, uh, people trying to, you know, you know, make things the best they have. What about Roberto Bolaño? I haven't read a lot of Roberto Bolaño. Uh, Roberto Bolaño. Um, it's not much you know, of a. There's yeah. not much of a connection to There's not a connection jumping to mind, but I mention it because um, you. I think magical realism is sort of poorly understood in mm. the sense that like I don't like you're I mean for anyone who's wondering the the, the, the book like Shane Race's book is is not magical realism it's, it's very realist like there's nothing ha that happens there that that's particularly magical in like any way but but I, I to me magical realism is about resorting to like like a world of traditional myth in a way that it, it doesn't, it just it doesn't mean that un, unlikely things happen or that absurd things happen. To me, it means that you're you're touching some other part of everyday life that that is sort of separate from the everyday life of like you know doing the laundry and like you know getting the car serviced. Mm -hmm. But um, but I you know it's interesting. I can I can actually kind of see that in the sense that the the narrator spends so much time on his own, sort of thinking about stuff. Mm -hmm. There's 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 something, there is something sacred about everyday small tasks. Um, you know, he drives, he drives like a sewage truck, right? And he just sort of does one like sort of monotonous task after another. But you, you can see the little, the, the, the thing that's magical about the book is that he sees, you know, the details of, you know, the people he services with the sewage truck or, you know, the, the weather as he's driving around. It's, it's those little things that, that make, that, that sort of help his life have coherence in it. Um, so that's, that's, that's interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't real, that's something I, I hadn't seen, but, but now that you mm -hmm. mentioned it, I think I can see a little bit of it. So thank you for, and we, we, we may come back if there's more mm -hmm. Q and A, but um, I wanna move on to Maria. So I, just a few things about Maria's book. So one of the things that I love about suburban souls is there's this portrait of this like enraged offended like burn this house down feminism that we have in the protagonist Gerda he's sort of an anti-hero it's easy to dismiss her as someone who's flawed and self-destructive I mean she's like really like mean to her children she's she's angry but there's also this like gleeful portrait of like a despondent housewife who is unafraid of being needy and afraid of being angry and sexually rejected and raging about her distant husband not loving her so uh, there uh, it makes me always think of this comedian Phil Hartman on the, from The Simpsons who died very tragically in the 90s and one of the things he said about his estranged wife before he died was I retreat into my cave and she throws rocks to get me out. So there's a lot of that dynamic between Gerda and her husband, Saul, who's estranged for most of the book. And it's complicated by the Holocaust because they're Jews who barely escaped to America as children from the Nazis. It's complicated by 
1970s feminism and sexual liberation versus this really repressive version of domesticity. And it's complicated by infidelity. But to me, the true focus of suburban souls is this primal, destructive, universal drive to be loved and to be visible when the world refuses to love you or to see you. So my first question to Maria, which has two parts, is first, um, why do you focus on the theme of need and dependency in your work? And why do you focus on, on those topics? And why does, it, why does the book need to take place in 1970s San Francisco? Well, let me start with the first one, the, the second one. The 1970s San Francisco Bay Area was a time of, how can I say, ferment and hope. The 60s whole hippie movement had taken place. People were experimenting with sexual freedom, with drugs, with communal living, with all kinds of new terrain. They were trying to break old barriers and they were breaking um, part of it. There are psychics. One of the main characters is a, a psychic of rather skeptical ethics, rather dubious morality, let's say. And the first question you're talking about, about the enraged feminism, about not being seen, not being heard, like and that really connects with Shane Race's book about the lack of communication, which is really a major theme and how it need and dependency. I think as a woman, I was brought up very much in this need dependency sort of matrix of being where a woman was nothing without a man and the man was supposed to be the, the breadwinner, the, the supreme authority, the woman was supposed to gain power in sort of manipulative ways. And so she's up against this whole framework of need and dependency, of the fact that she needs to be dependent, that's ingrained in her somehow, and she hates it. And as for Saul, the husband, he's just been he needs, again, the dependency is very real. They both, neither feels quite strong enough to stand on their own feet, two feet. They need somebody. And that person they're trying to lean on is failing them. Neither of them hear each other, really. Neither of them really see each other or get who the other person is. Um, in addition to their own families, which were quite disturbed, there's this generic sense of the whole culture, the whole German culture, trying to annihilate them before they managed to get out of Germany when they were children. So there's that kind of subliminal sense underneath. Yeah, that's all. That's there's a, so much going on in suburban souls. Um, one aspect of this book that I find fascinating um, is the ambivalence. So I'm going to bring up um, something, uh, an interesting fact, which is that Maria has a connection to someone that I have a massive fa fascination with, um, who herself had very deep ties to both San Francisco and New York, which is Anais Nin, like, you know, Henry, Henry and June. And I've mm -hmm. read all of the unexpurgated diaries. And I'm like, a huge fan, right? Like even the ones that nobody reads, like the, the like the six that came afterwards, and like they put out one in 2017 or 2018. I'm like a huge fan. So I didn't realize this until we were almost going to press because, like I said, I tried to focus on the books as I sort of look at the manuscripts. But I was looking around for a photo on Maria's website, and I realized that Anais Nin had actually corresponded with Maria and read some of her poems in I think the late 60s and offered you know this appreciation and praise of her poetry which is awesome. So to realize that Anais Nin and I have somehow connected across time and space through Maria and you know her books and her poetry means so much to me as, as a publisher. So I wanna thank Maria for that. Um, but that, that got me thinking a little bit about Anais Nin and sort of what are the ways in which there are correspondences to sort of her work and to Goethe. So, 
I, I was actually reading the latest the latest diary. Um, like I said, from it's called Trapeze. So Gerda is deeply conflicted by her life, as is Anais Nin. I mean, Anais Nin is a Cuban who marries and falls in love with American men. She doesn't like American men. She, so you, you read the diary, she doesn't like them. She thinks they're really basic. The last love of Anais Nin's life was an American man who lived in the Big Sur area. And this actually reinforces all of her complaints. So mm -hmm. like, you know, American men make her cook, they make her clean, uh, they make her bake pies. She, she has to hang out with neighbors. She thinks they're ass boring. They're Philistines. They listen to the radio too much. Uh, this guy reads too much Time magazine. I think this is the equivalent in the 1950s of someone watching like Meet the Press all the time. Like I hate Meet the Press. So she can't stand American men. And yet she loves American men. Uh, and there's this similar ambivalence in her diaries about America in general. Because during the 50s, apparently Anais Nin went through this like slump in her career where like nobody read her. The American mainstream wasn't picking her up. Everyone lost so much money on her, on her, on her books. And so the other half of the diary which is like completely safe for work is like how much American readers suck. It's like these people are troglodytes, they're boring, they don't understand Freud, they don't read, they watch too many movies. And yet the irony is that history like has shown that Anais Nin's readers, I think are, you know, it's a very American, it's a very American milieu. It would be like unthinkable to think of Anais Nin as being situated anywhere but in America to me. I think of her as like being completely American in every way in the sense that she's an immigrant, you know, she thinks self-consciously about the difference between mass media and like, you know, whatever she's doing. She's, she's, she, she's conflicted about every aspect of American life, which to me is like a sign that you're really American. So, you know, one question I have for you, Maria, is that, you know, how do you see Gerda's role as an immigrant, especially someone from the, you know, who has a lot of old world roots and a stranger as being a part of how she interfaces with her environment in America? And do you think visibility is a deeper issue for her than, you know, not just in her, the personal sexual sense, but also in some global social sense as well? It's an interesting question. Before I answer it, I'd like to digress a bit and say that my original attraction to Anais Nin was that she wrote in the voice of a woman. I grew up in the 50s, where the writers I read, most of them, even the women, seem to be having a guardedness about their true feelings and a kind of male voice, which I found artificial, a kind of masculine, pseudo strong voice. And so they were imitating Kermis, Ernest Hemingway. So I was very attracted to Anais Nin because she began writing, she was one of the first people I wrote, began who wrote about real female feelings, emotions. And Gerda, I suppose, is an extension of that in a very, very extended way. So she came from Europe where, ironically, I felt that women were more visible and more respected in Europe than they were in the United States. When I first traveled to Europe and I was in Paris for a long time, a couple of years, I felt the women were much, much more visible, more heard, more freer in a sense than they were in our country. And yes, they had the traditional roles of homemaker as they did in Germany. So I'm, I'm wondering about that. I think she may have felt a loss of identity and of being seen and heard and coming to this country rather than in a gaining of it. Does that make any sense? No, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's very complicated because, I mean, she writes about, you know, Cuba, about America, and, and she came over at like a complicated age, like, you know, when she was maybe a teenager or like 10 years old. And, you know, so you're, you're, and I, I, you know, I know this from personal experience too, your, your views of a culture are colored by your own individual experiences with, with the culture, you know, even if that's not completely grounded in fact. Um, it's, no, I, I see so much of these themes that, you know, initially came up probably during the 60s and the 70s in feminism, but that are still sort of prevalent in different forms. People are still asking the same 
questions now. There's, I mean, her simmering resentment at having, you know, like someone, uh, this this guy like wanting her to bake a pie because it's like, it tastes better than like a store-bought pie. Just her rage at like someone like making her do that when she should be like writing. It, that's so resonant, you know, like that's like, like every first date where someone asks me if I like to cook, that, 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 that like burns my memory <laughs> as being like, like, this is like, this is like the worst thing ever. You know, there's, but you know, I, the, the questions are still there. And the cool thing about Anaya Stan and the cool thing about Gerda as a character is that they both have no boundaries, right? So, so they say all these things. The diary, you know, gives Anaya Stan that freedom and being like, you know, mentally unstable gives Gerda the other type of freedom. But they're able to, to say what a lot of people in everyday non-magical realism life are like actually just thinking constantly and, and to me that's the freedom of, of suburban souls is that like gleeful like I'm gonna burn this place down you know type type of attitude and and it's not even like a political sense right like it's, it's you just want to burn the place down because you're pissed off and it, there's I, I think there isn't enough of that transparency in in a lot of the books I read so I found that very refreshing um what I'm thinking of is in places like Mexico, women are perhaps less visible freedom, but they're more deeply respected. It's a matriarchy. And also in Europe, I feel there, at least there was a much deeper respect for women. And I think the United States is a very male, masculine kind of country in its sensibility. Yeah, it's not, but but the irony, and the irony is that it's not enjoyed, right? Like it's full of, I, I feel like, you know, when you, I'm thinking back to the election um, and we, we actually had talks, the, the group of writers that were launching this year, had we had talks about whether we should have launches like before or after the election, or we should have like one before and one after. And I was like, well, what is that? Like, does that mean, I was like, maybe, may, maybe if, if, maybe if it went one way, we would like burn book, burn our books or something, or mm -hmm. I don't know. But, but I can actually see his point now, which is that, you know, having reflected on what happened in, in the election, I don't think it's a political statement to say that there was a lot of rage because people that were not traditionally considered to be disenfranchised felt very disenfranchised for reasons that may have been like completely valid but mm -hmm. are not discussed at all um and this kind of goes back to sort of my views about you know the press and you know what's important in running the press you know what what does visibility mean what does being heard mean uh, i think that the feeling of being heard is is so complicated you, and suburban souls sort of exemplifies that. I think may we all pick the shrapnel from, maybe one day pick all the shrapnel from our hearts exemplifies that. Mm. It, it, takes, it takes so much. I mean, Virginia Woolf simplifies it as like a room of your own, but to actually get there mentally and emotionally for any gender, any race is, is so difficult. Um, and you know, maybe this is coherent to me because like I pick the books, you know, when I read the manuscripts and, and you know, so this is kind of like the, the headspace behind my, behind like this sort of set of books I, I put out, but it's, it, it, I don't, I'm not sure exactly where I'm going with it, but, but it is about visibility of sort of groups that feel profoundly disenfranchised. Um, you know, maybe I, I, I'm, I'm not, not having any like sort of social theory background. I, I can't say what to make of that, but but it is something that that you see and that I think is becoming more prevalent in literature and you know in blogs and things. I see a connection between all may all the shrapnel fall and and suburban souls. This great a kind of. Well, the lack of communication that causes so much suffering. And in Shane Race's novel, there's a beautiful, almost poetic sort of bleakness to the whole thing. And that hard fact, as you talk about 
being stoic. And then Saul is feeling some of that in suburban souls. He's a lot less stoic, but again, he's not able to express himself, to, to speak in a way that connects with people. He says, if only he could think of something to comfort his daughter, Hannah, but he does, he's not able to. All he can do is scold her for forgetting some kind of household chore. And he's suffering inside, but he's not able to reach out of himself to reach her. Yeah, that's the flip side of stoicism. Yeah. Um, no, that's really good. I mean, I every time I, I talk about these these books, I come up, you know, I, I see something different. Um, Taryn, is, does, does it make sense to move to Q&As now? Um, having tormented Shay Race and Maria for long enough? <laughs> or if were there questions ready. or... I think that yeah, would be maybe great. Now's the time. Yeah, um, I do have a question for you, Sarong. How how many submissions do you get? Well, if I publicize it, I get like thousands, and if I don't publicize it, I get like about three hundred um, per year, but per round. Um, you know, I lately I haven't been publicizing it that much because I've noticed this is like very mysterious, like no matter how many submissions I get, about each year I, I find about five or six that I like. Um, and it, I don't know how that shakes out, but um, it's, it's difficult. I read them all myself, right? So it's, it's a difficult process. So, so I, I think the writers have incredible patience. I think Shane Race, like, I think your manuscript took like, like a really unconscionable length of time for me to sort of get through it. Like I requested the manuscript and like that took another six months. You know, it's sometimes life just gets ahead of me and, and the production sort of takes up a lot of time. And, and then once you get really behind, you kind of like hide from it. So I think after these books fully launch, I'll have to start reading the slush again. <laughs> It's so dis discouraging because some of it's like so old. <laughs> you just get like shamed of yourself, but mm. but it is rewarding once you once you find the manuscript that that you really want. Uh, well, that's great that there's so many people writing and producing great things. <laughs> now, do you um, have a like? What's the process? People submit a manuscript to you. You read it when you get to it, and then. How does it work for independent presses? Yeah, it's a, it's so, you know, I, I'm, I try to be as informal as possible in the sense, I don't have like a specific date, you know, people, if, when people want to send me something, they send me something and I don't have specific reading periods. Um, I, I take simultaneous submissions. So, and I think that accounts for, you know, a, a lot of the volume that I get. Um, it is, it is very, the, the submission and the reviewing the manuscripts aspect of it is actually the, the most difficult one because the rest of it, you can kind of predict how long it takes to produce a book. But the, the uncontrolled factor here is sort of whether you come up against manuscripts that are, that require you to like think about very closely whether to take them. And most manuscripts are, either like I love them at first sight or and, and and like even just skimming them like I know I want to take this or even just skimming it like I know I would never publish this so those decisions are actually made very very quickly the things that are difficult are the ones where like I have I'm kind of conflicted about it so it means I have to read it like relatively closely and you know that gets pushed to the back burner and that that can drag the process on for a long time it's really the toughest part like having to make that that decision Right, I'm sure. And then I have one more question, you know, on the, uh, the nuts and bolts side of publishing. When, when you decide that you like a manuscript, do you then advise the author to have an editor go over it with a fine tooth comb and continue like shape it? Or do you have, do you have your own team that you call in at this point? No, I, I, so, so, and this is idiosyncratic, but I don't buy fixer uppers. I, I've done it like once or twice. Um, and I, I was like, never again. So, so if something comes that, that I like, 
I, I trust the process and, you know, that's the, the way it, it, I, I just buy it like as a finished product, right? Like I'm not, I'm not going to resand the floors and like build a patio and like redig the basement or whatever. And, and, and I think that's, that's partly because there's a, this is a very, very lean, small scale operation, but I think partly I, tr you know, who knows, you know, whether that paragraph should be split up into to into two paragraphs, right? I think reasonable minds can defer about most things literary. Like, I, I don't believe in there being one universal, um, in one universal attitude towards craft. I think craft comes in many, many different forms. And, and, and if the general impression is one that is aesthetically, um, that is aesthetically positive, I would not tinker with it because you know that's sort of the prerogative of the author who had the initial sort of verbal vision of what to write. Um, so I, I think that's idiosyncratic that I have this sort of non, not non-judgmental, but I, I don't have strong views about how specific things always need to be said or presented. You know, I, I try to take a more intuitive approach. Um, and you know, maybe I, I I think the results are pretty good, but but honestly, like who knows? You know, like that that's sort of the spiritual exercise of running the press. You 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 have to sort of believe at the end of the day that that you got it right. <laughs> right. Well, I think from the author's point of view, you just want to know how this how this publishing situation is going to work with this publisher, um, because there's so much variability. And, uh, you know, you just want to know going in, all right, I need to get my, my ducks in the row as far as the manuscript is concerned, make sure that, you know, I'm not creating any, uh, anything awful, that I'm yeah, actually absolutely. producing the best product as possible. So, um, yeah, and I trust, and, and I think writers kind of know, you know, like, like, I think they're, I think when people put together, like, a large work of fiction, people, most most people who sort of have, who know what they're doing, like it's a coherent vision, you know, in mm -hmm. the sense that it, it, you know, the, like you can sort of debate, you can sort of debate back and forth, like, should it be this way or should it be that way? But and I always feel like, I always lean towards trusting the author more um, than maybe a lot of other people do. Mm -hmm. but, but part of it also is that logistically, and th this goes sort of to the role of, of an indie press, logistically, I, I, I don't have the, the resources to, buy, to sign a manuscript that needs like a lot of work and a lot of like, you know, TLC. Like I accept that whatever, whatever, whatever manuscripts I take are sort of in their essentially final form. Right. Um, Christine posted a question that she would like to hear more about Shane Race's title and how that came to pass. Uh, yeah, um, I talked with uh, Sierra Rong about it during the uh, the launch uh, event. Um, one of the influences uh, we talked to then was a, a Japanese writer by the name of Ken Zaburo Oe, um, and he was known to, well, he's still alive, he's known to write some really, you know, uh, interesting title to his works like uh, Teach You, Teach Us to Outgrow Our Madness, or uh, Rise Up, You Young Men of a New um, Generation. Just really beautiful uh, titles. And that was like kind of the, the point of, uh, you know, having such a, you know, um, you know, long title. That was always interesting to me. Um, the, the actual title refers to uh, cynicism and negativity and just kind of the, um, uh, if you allow it that, you know, that cynicism can really build up over time. And, you know, maybe one time, uh, you know, we could, you know, learn to let go over cynicism, you know, maybe we pick all the shrapnel, shrapnel being the cynicism from our hearts. That's interesting that you mentioned, um, being influenced and paying attention to other people's titles. Um, because I find that I spend a lot of time looking at titles and, you know, they convey so much information about the theme and the tone and the, the feel of the book. Um, so, yeah, that's interesting. 
Um, does anyone else have any other questions that you want to pose in the chat space, or shall we shall we open this up to just general conversation? Not. I don't see that anyone else has questions. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and open things up for <clears throat> general conversation. Um, so if you would like to chat, let's unmute yourself. Hi, hi, Linda, are you? Yeah, hi. No, no, no. No, okay. <laughs> hi, anyway. <laughs> um, I, I guess I would like to thank um, both Surong, Shamrus, and Maria for a great presentation. Um, I liked that it did not follow a traditional form. Um, it's a bit scary to think of being one of the authors, but um, I thought that the, um, the authors um, uh, gave extremely interesting responses and that it, it made for an extremely um, successful presentation. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, looks like Mana has a question um, for both the authors. Did you have, did you pay for an editor to go over your manuscripts before submitting the first time around to Tailwind? Uh, uh, I'll start. I did uh, 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 get a line editor. Um, I didn't do that the full developmental ed editing just because I knew that, you know, it's a small book. Um, and what's interesting is um, I didn't know where I was going to. Um, uh, you know, publish it at all. And it was a bad editor that said, hey, why don't you check out small presses, go to this one, you know, website where, you know, the, you know, the, the names listed, you know, and uh, that's where I found Tail Rope Winds was actually through this, uh, you know, uh, MLP.com, I forget what it's called. Um, there's a directory of small presses. I'll try to find it. And yes, I also did. I got, I hired an editor to do sort of a rough look at the whole thing, not particularly with typos, but just roughnesses. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was very much in shape when I gave it to her. And yes, she did do typos too. That's good. I mean, hiring an editor can be a wonderful experience or you could just really plow a lot of money in there because yeah of, <laughs> of what the editor's opinion of how your book should um mm -hmm. what shape that book should take um but you really need to have one <laughs> at least someone to go over and make sure that you've you know dotted your i's and crossed your t's or vice versa <laughs> yeah um, let's see, Maria, what gave you the inspiration or ideas for your story? This is from Sandra. You know, I'm thinking about it and I was thinking a lot about my mother, which I hadn't thought about previously growing up in the fifties and how oppressed she felt by not just her husband, but by the whole set of circumstances, by the whole milieu, and also very much by my father, who was very much engrossed in his own work. His, he was a sculptor he was, and a teacher, very engrossed in his own life and career. And he was so insensitive, really, to what was going on with her. And finally, actually, she had a lover who I really liked. He was one of our a great family friend, he and his wife. And I really, it was not a good I, thought of mine, but I thought, you know, she'd be better off with him. He's much more sensitive and empathic. And I could see what was really disturbing her. And then I also happened to know a lot of Bay Area Holocaust survivors, people who got out of Germany or got out of Europe just in time. And I go few that had to go through the whole camps too, and how it how it affected them on a very deep level, and how it ties into a whole centuries long sense, almost ingrained, I think, in so many Jews. Certainly, I feel it's ingrained in my old genetic code of just being on ready for the next pogrom to break out, ready to flee, and a whole set, a whole 
chemistry that sort of revolves it around that it really does encode in the body cells, I think. Yeah, I wonder what uh, what's encoding in our in our uh, physical memories, you know, now with what we're living through. It's interesting. <laughs> that <you bring> that <laughs> up. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Does anyone else have any other questions, or would you like to chat directly with the speakers? Feel free to turn your mic off. I mean, turn it on and say hello. Let's. Uh, Let's do that. Hi, Christine. It's nice to see you. Haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's so good to uh, to be here, at least um, virtually, if not uh, in person. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad this is happening. <laughs> Anyone else have any comments for our speakers or me or each other? Well, I guess I wanted to thank you for hosting this whole event. And I wanted to thank Shane Rice for inviting me and Sirong for inviting me and really appreciate it. Yes, I've ordered your books to be um, available at, at the Mechanics Institute's library. So um, I'm not sure when they'll come in because uh, things are a little bit uh, uncertain right now with um, with mails and with book ordering, but uh, it will eventually be in our collection. And of course, our catalogers are only coming in coming in once a week. <clears throat> so, um, but eventually it will be there, and you'll you'll see it on the shelf. <laughs> no, that's that's great. Oh, there a question came in. Well, I was see, just going to say thank you to Taryn um, and you know Shane Rice and Maria for sort of letting me publish their books, and also to Taryn for hosting this event. I mean. This is this is awesome. You're I, very I, I, welcome. I do appreciate it very much. There is another question from Mana. She asks, um, I guess directly to Maria, if you have any advice on how to deal with people who are Holocaust deniers. Wow. Hmm. I don't really know. Yeah, like, uh, I think it's a, the way I also feel that I have to deal with people who are Trump supporters. What can I say? <laughs> I think you can deal with the you know Holocaust deniers in the same way as they deal with the Holocaust. Just deny them. Just like you don't exist. How do you prove that you exist, huh? Right. Right. Um, yeah. It's Actually. I can understand some Trump supporters because I understand a lot of the economic problems that people have gone through and the fact that people are disenfranchised. But yeah, I don't know what to say to the person who denies the Holocaust. Just they've got a very different worldview. Yeah, that might be what it's all about. Mm -hmm. um, all right, well, I, I think we're losing some of our audience. So I just wanna thank everyone for coming and thank all of our speakers. Uh, you've, uh, Sarong, you are an amazing interviewer, so. I look forward to working with you in the future. <laughs> the, this is this is an amazing, really powerful platform. I'm, you know, this this is amazing. I'm I'm really ha really happy that you know you you were able to host this and it came together. So, that's great. great. All right. Well, we'll be in touch. Thank you, everyone, and I look forward to seeing you virtually at another one of our programs shortly. Thanks so much, and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.